So, welcome everyone, uh, good morning, and um, this is the second day of our uh, Cold War International uh, Student Conference. So, uh, let me introduce um, uh, Victor Phillips, a um, uh, lecturer from Columbia University, who uh, was already chairing the panel yesterday, and she will have the keynote speech uh, at the opening of this second session. Uh, Victor, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank you all, and uh, thank you, Professor Beckish, for um, a wonderful time. Um, we want to thank Corvinus, um, West Point Military Academy, um, Columbia University's History Department, um, the European Institute's Cultural Initiative, um, and um, the Radio Free Liberty Radio, uh, Radio uh, Liberty um, Radio Free Europe uh, Research Project, and all of our fellows. Um, I think, um, in particular, um, we stand here in solidarity with Central European Institute um, and um, the Open Society Archives. Um, this is a very key moment um, in our political histories um, as, um, as a nation where we are visitors in our own nation um, and globally um, with uh, increasing turmoil. Um, it is importantly, um, it is more important than ever um, for us to stand up for our beliefs um, and, um, uh, and take action. Um, most importantly, I want to thank my students um, and all of you in the audience. Um, it is my honor to teach, um, to work with all of you one-on-one -on -one in the archives. Um, and this paper, although I draw different conclusions, um, I directly um, focus on the work of Monique Kill, um, Stephanie Sonkin, and uh, Peter Zalokovas, um, who were all students of mine in the last two years, one of them a Radio Free Europe fellow. So my work literally would not be possible with, without you all, so thank you. Um, as a historian, I feel that whenever I judge, um, given the political moments, it's awfully easy to um, take pot shots, to take direct shots, to use history to condemn. Um, but as a, as a historian, it is my job to unpack, um, to look at the present in light of the future without judgment. If we judge, we get clouded. Um, and um, the critical thought goes out the window. Um, these are heady political times. Um, as historians, it seems as though we can luxuriate in the past, yet our time is now. Facts lead us to truths, and I underscore the, plur the plural of truths. There's the stuff of history that leads us to understandings of our present. While many of us see the post-truth moment as an, as an election day in the US, Indeed, the book, The Post-Truth Era, was published in 2004. The book um, uh, critiques um, uh, Trump only in the context of his book and reality show earnings, um, and, um, and he you, and quoted him talking about truthful hyperbole. Indeed, 2004 was a key moment for me, personally, culturally. Um, I could bring in an anecdote. Um, I was working on my PhD and thus um, a negligent mother, allowing my, my, uh, my uh, children to have control of the television. Um, I walked in and there were my three girls watching a reality show. While they were watching the reality show, they were reading um, a People magazine with the reality show being covered in the magazine, and indeed it was a rerun. And I said to them, sweethearts, it's a reality show? You think this is a reality show? This is the, I said, you're reading about it, and it's a rerun. How can this be reality? Oh, Mom, you don't understand anything. And I realized I don't understand anything. This is a post-truth, post-reality moment, the likes of which they have integrated into themselves as young people. What are the implications of this? Um, so what I'm looking at um, in political propaganda bat battle battles is how truth was used as a weapon. So if truth derives from facts, the construction of facts derived from a shared reality. It's driven into a narrative. If reality becomes a commodity to be bought and sold, does the whole system come tumbling down? The problem of truth has gone viral. Um, Scotty Nell Hughes, often thought to represent Trump, said the following according to the New York Times during the political campaign, one thing that has been interesting during the campaign season is that people say facts are facts, but they're not really facts. There's no such thing anymore as facts. In this time of alternative facts and reality is constructed for the camera that is positive as just another observer in the room, how do we understand the history of Americanized truth 
in the Cold War. The use of truth in narratives to define the United States as a valid, competent, moral, and potent international force, mm -hmm. both through rhetoric and military moves. And what are the implications of the disintegration of this American cultural attachment to truth telling and reality, even if admitting that it lied? Dressed up in the guise of an absolute, during the Cold War, truth was positioned as a universal mandate and intrinsically linked to Western ideals of freedom and democracy, built one fact at a time. Cultural products from radio broadcasts, print campaigns, television programs, even bubblegum cards, truth was made into a commodity and Americanized. Is this moment of post-truth post the resulting backlash against American triumphalism in the post-Cold War globalized era? I like to play with periodization. As we discussed last year at this conference, even within the same year, historians define and redefine the start and end of the Cold War from the Bolshevik Revolution to it hasn't yet ended. Um, but when it comes to, uh, to truth as a defining part of the American character, I go back to the start of the nation um, and its first president, George Washington. Here we have the, the cherry tree narrative. Um, yet the Declaration of Independence makes this global. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. The Declaration of Indep Independence relies on facts as the vehicle to claim truths for citizens by objecting to the king of Great Britain. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. There's then a list of facts, a description of things that the king did that, that are irrefutable. Thus begins facts and truths as American product for world consumption. While other political figures systematically invoke truth narratives to support their political project, the next clear milestone is linked to Abraham Lincoln, or Honest Abe, and the projection of a just nation with the abolition of slavery. Thus, truth as an Americanized political project did not suddenly erupt with the start of the Cold War. These cold flames merely stoked the fire that had already been built. I always bring it back to Rockefeller and Roosevelt, interwar the struggle of Voice of America to base its output on journalistic truth. Even before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States government's Office, uh, office, of, uh, court, office of the coordinator, coordinator of Information had already begun providing war news and commentary to the commercial American shortwave radio stations for use on a voluntary basis. Direct programming began approximately seven weeks after the United States entered World War II with the first live broadcast to Germany, Voices from America, in, Fe in February 1942. It was introduced by the Battle Hymn of the Republic and included the pledge today and every day from now on, we will be with you from America to talk about the war. The news may, not, may be good or bad for us, we will always tell the truth. By the end of the war, VOA had 39 transmitters and provided service in 40 languages. The Campaign of Truth. After World War II, Truman dismantled the Office of War Information, a, pro a propaganda outlet thought to be unnecessary in peacetime. Yet in a remarkable step, Truman decided to keep a modest information program to support US foreign policy. Then with the Cold War, the instrument became active. The Soviet Union was credited with having superior propaganda. We had to respond. And in 1948, the Smith-Mundt Act initiated such informational programs by the government. In 1947, Voice of America started broadcasting to the Soviet system, citizens in Russia under the pretext of countering, quote, more harmful instances of Soviet propaganda directed against American leaders and policies. The Soviet Union responded by, by initiating jamming. In 1948, George Kennan, the father of containment, rolled out National Security Council document 10-2, which authorized propaganda in efforts, interestingly, Strongly supported, um, he strongly supported CIA um, support of the arts and propaganda in the face of congressional opposition to funding. Um, so as we saw with John Carlo, there was this neat matrix um, that was created every time one branch um, would say no, another branch would find some funding, and it worked to the print media um, and also um, to the private sector, as we'll see. In 1950, Truman intensified the call to action with a propaganda campaign, Campaign of Truth, and a speech delivered to the American Society of Newspaper Editors. This is very important that he went to the news media um, to um, talk about truth. To combat the enemy, Soviet, quote, lies, we needed to promote truth. He then went to Congress. Truth is on our side, he said. 
Communist leaders fear the truth more than any weapon at our command. We must now throw resources into a campaign of truth which will match in vigor and determination the measures we have adopted in meeting military problems. Thus, soft power meets hard power. He continued, I regard such an expanded campaign of truth as vital to our national security. The budget leapt from 20 million in 1948 to 115 by 1952. It was a trend that transcended that particular president. The campaign uh, also included um, the private sector with the Ad Council. News output shifted from objective sounding flat reporting to a sensationalist to sensationalist, hard-hitting stories and cartoons and commentary. So the seeds of our media were sown. General Deutte Eisenhower, here's a campaign of truth, um, and this shows um, the, uh, uh, um, the process of journalism um, taking on um, the campaign, not only with print, but also, very importantly, with images that could be read by everyone. Life was a, a force um, as a magazine, and not only did it have its own circulation, but like the radio, it was passed from person to person, like our leaflets passed from person to person. Um, General Dwight D. Eisenhower inaugurated the Crusade for Freedom on, in September 1950, um, and um, freedom and westernized truth somehow became conflated. The first chairman was Lucius D. Clay, Eisenhower's successor as military governor of occupied Germany. The crusade for, free, for freedom, officially managed by the National Committee for a Free Europe, had direct ties to the Pol Office of Policy Coordination, the State Department, the CIA. It was one of the highest profile domestic propaganda operations in CIA history. He said, this crusade is a campaign sponsored by private American citizens to fight the big lie with the big truth. Under the careful watch of the military general, truth becomes linked to political freedom and democracy. Corporate members were many and included Henry Ford, um, uh, foundations, um, rabbis, and um, archbishops. Um, the CIA provided much of the funding. Um, and what happens, truth then becomes a commodity. The official domestic goal of the Crusade for Freedom was to solicit donations from American citizens, and it succeeded in raising a million, 1.3 million in its first year. However, these funds represented only a small portion of the total amount spent on Radio Free Europe. But the idea is that truth can be bought for each dollar. Each dollar that you contribute buys a um, hundred minutes of truth. A penny is a, is a word. So here's the print ad, um, and um, relying on Monique Kill, um, we see all sorts, these, these are a dissertation. <laughs> um, the, the, the gendering, um, wanted the man pondering, the woman wanting to know, um, she is encouraged to um, buy uh, less meat so that she can give more truth dollars. Um, he's figuring out how to barbecue in the backyard to create truth dollars. So there's, the text is wonderful, the gender is, <laughs> gendering is wonderful, but again, um, an entire paper. Um, and here we have, we go straight back um, to our president um, and a campaign um, with um, our friend George Washington, the first American truth teller, um, and he wants your truth dollars too. Um, we fight communism with truth dollars. This shows um, that this wasn't just a print campaign. Driving down the, the road, you saw these signs. Um, and here um, we see youth and religion um, give us our day, this day, our daily truth. Um, again, um, we, uh, the, the campaigns not only um, brought in um, government projects and the um, crusade for freedom, um, but also um, private corporations got on board. Um, and um, these Bowman playing cards are fascinating. Um, we've got religion on the back of each box. You, get your, you buy your box of, of cards. You get some um, bubble gum that's wrapped in our red menace bubble gum. Um, and, but before we open it, we have to take our crusader oath. I believe in God and the God-given freedom of man. And then here are some examples of the playing cards. Um, some of them are, don't seem particularly appropriate for children, but fine. <coughs> Um, so Hollywood was involved, um, and um, they were promoting messages such as fight the big lie with the big truth and help, tr help truth fight communism. Um, 
Yet returning to the crusade days, Ronald Reagan was a major U.S. spokesperson for the campaign. He starred in a pro-crusade film, The Big Truth, which depicts Radio Free Europe broadcast into, into Czechoslovakia. Clips of this film were shown as advertisements for the Crusade for Freedom during the 1951-52 um, campaign. So we'll watch. My name is Ronald Reagan. Last year, the contributions of 16 million Americans to the Crusade for Freedom made possible the World Freedom Bell, symbol of hope and freedom for the communist-dominated peoples of Eastern Europe. And through this powerful 135,000-watt radio free Europe transmitter in Western Germany, this station daily pierces the Iron Curtain with the truth, answering the lies of the Kremlin and bringing a message of hope to millions trapped behind the Iron Curtain. Grateful letters from listeners smuggled past the secret police express thanks to Radio Free Europe for identifying communist quislings and informers by name. General Lucius D. Clay now asks all Americans to join with him in a second great crusade for freedom to build two more powerful freedom stations that will send more messages of truth and hope through the Iron Curtain and to establish Radio Free Asia to stop the spread of communism in the Far East. The Crusade for Freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Join now by sending your contributions to General Clay, Crusade for Freedom, Empire State Building, New York City. Or join in your local community. <laughs> Um, so although um, I've dashed pretty quickly through the Cold War from Eisenhower to, to Reagan, um, one of the things that becomes very important here is as um, conservatives claim Reagan um, as their hero, um, indeed the great communicator understood the vital importance of communication, as we can see um, from the beginning of his career before he was a politician. Under his watch, the, his cultural apparatus increased funding innovated with television broadcasts, and established new anti-communist radio projects with a station in Florida to fight the Castro regime. Historians and politicians tend to forget Reagan's dedication to cultural diplomacy and spending in the face of Star Wars and walls coming down. From his start as an actor who promoted American truth-telling to the fantastic pronouncements that he backed with the image of a simple truth-telling cowboy, he understood and thus funded cultural projects that promoted the United States. He knew they worked over time, if given time. Yet, did the Cold War commodify the truth? Did the selling of truth, truth magazine spreads, contests, playing cards, and the like, all with the intentions ultimately to allow the communist capitalist fat man story to be realized in the commodification of its core values? How can we now return to those core values? That's our job as historians and students. So I asked myself as a historian, how do I practice my craft when ideas about the construction of facts is coming under pressure. As when we were children and our parents, those of us from America, asked us to do something that we didn't want to do, we cried, it's a free country, and stamped our feet. <laughs> so now this idea of freedom as a childhood excuse to do whatever one pleases has hit the concept of facts. And here comes childish freedom. Is it a free country with freedom of speech? As a child, this leads to the foot stomping, I can say whatever I want to. So once it is said, it somehow now becomes the job of the listener, the public, to prove it's not true. As a historian, I've been trending towards making my Cold War narratives more readable. As a budding historian, I was taught not to use adjectives. My professors went through and crossed out every adjective. I became unreadable. Discussing what ca the character wears, Googling the weather, setting up context became the new me. But what of the footnote here? And what of accuracy? The use of overblown adjectives has undermined political truths. Catastrophe, great, big, incredible, finish line, great, so, so, massive surprises, great, famous, get it done. I am now finding myself inclined to take no license unless the weather can be confirmed by a note in the local paper, which it can. Thus, I have had to make that extra step. Yet, what of oral history? We know that memory is a tricky thing. Truth, 
Is it just that moment when you go to sleep at night? But then we have to be practical and concrete. Here lies the moment where we can stand on our moral ground in the international arena with a footnote as historians. The Radio Free Europe project was founded based on the idea that while the literature of the cultural field in the Cold War was just opening up, the papers are extremely vast. Thus there's the gap, that wonderful gap that we all look for as historians. The Radio Free Fellows and I have the honor of traipsing across Europe and the United States to look for archives and raid one series of papers against another. From Budapest to London, Warsaw and Berlin, we have seen a carless rush hour in Abilene, Kansas at the Eisenhower archives. The waitress at Ike is also the archivist where we eat on daily dinner. Um, new oral histories are being collected. We're making new archives. So there is the vital moment for us as historians, the footnote. With proper citations and detailed documents, we can have discussions because the next historian can look at these same documents and the discussion begins. We can now not hide documents from others, we share them on Dropbox. Without this, in whatever form, the document being paper, film, television, music, a painting, a trading card, without the footnote, without the fact, there can be no discussion. Even if one historian challenges the reality of the contents in the cited document, there is a central target, the existence of which we can, all, uh, uh, we can all agree upon. Without that, we're lost. So did the commodification of truth during the Cold War backfire to create an American post-truth era? And if so, what can we do to repair this? Footnote, footnote, footnote. Through our footnotes, we can indeed take back the moment. It seems small but the implications are vast. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have the first panel, there is no break, so please uh, I ask all the panelists and the panel chair uh, to come and uh, occupy your positions. Good morning. I'm very happy to uh, present this uh, fourth panel of the conference, which is focused on soft power in the Cold War era. <coughs> and uh, our first presenter is Stephen Westlake, who is an MA student at Central European University. And he will be presenting on understanding US Cold War public diplomacy through the Radio Liberty Russian broadcast recordings. Thanks very much. Uh, if you just bear with me for just a couple of moments, I've got a little sound file I need to load up as well as part of this presentation. So I'll be with you in just a moment. Um, my name is Steve Westlake, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to be involved with this event. Yesterday was very, very interesting, so many interesting speakers, and 
it's a real pleasure for me to represent CEU and uh, take part in this event with so many illustrious colleagues. Uh, I'm especially grateful to be able to follow after Professor Phillips. I think there's a little bit of crossover with what we'll be talking about. So um, I thought instead of presenting a paper, I, I just wanted to sort of uh, introduce a project that I've been working on recently um, here at CEU. Uh, we're very lucky, we're blessed really to have the OSA archives connected to CU. So many of you in this room have, have felt the benefit of that this week and, and, and before. Um, so I just wanted to introduce this project that I've been working on because um, I think it ties in quite nicely with a lot of the themes we've been talking about. Um, so understanding US Cold War public, public diplomacy through the Radio Liberty Russian Broadcast Collection. Um, all of you who've worked at the OSA will know that there's so much great stuff there. <laughs> and one of the kind of hidden gems of the collection, I think, is their audiovisual archive. Um, in particular, what I've been working on is the Radio Liberty Russian Broadcast Archive. So um, it's a collection of over 26,000 separate audio files, which represent a real kind of treasure trove of uh, audio recordings, uh, original recordings that Radio Liberty delivered from its uh, inception in 1953 all the way through to the mid-90s, 2000s. Uh, and what I've done with this Speaking to the Soviets project is pulled together some of the most kind of interesting material and changed it into a, a more accessible audio documentary podcast format so that people who don't speak the original Russian uh, can also start to engage with these materials. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll briefly kind of outline the origins of, the, of this Speaking to the Soviets project that I've been working on. Um, what our aims were within the team, um, how we put together uh, the, pro the project, uh, what resulted from it, and then sort of st start to think about implications and further projects. Um, so in terms of our origins, uh, earlier in, in March, um, CU put out um, a call for uh, something called the Sound Relations Project, where they wanted to encourage people to engage with this audiovisual material at the archives and create something new um, to encourage uh, new engagement and uh, make things more accessible, essentially. Uh, and so there were a lot of different options uh, in terms of which audio materials could be used. Um, the OSA has a wide collection, and it's not just Radio for Europe and Radio Liberty materials they have. They have all sorts of things. But for me, as a scholar who's particularly interested in radio and transnational broadcasting more generally, I knew which, which collection I wanted to work with. Um, so uh, the podcast series that I'm putting together um, is going to be part of the CU's podcast library, which they're putting together as we speak, and uh, will be uh, online by September for everybody to listen to. Um, so uh, along with my colleague, Mikhail Gulayev, who um, is a member of the public policy team here at CU and is a Russian speaker, so very, very integral to, to the project. Um, we put together a, a proposal for to create a six-part podcast series called Speaking to the Soviets, where we would use the Blinken OSA's Radio Liberty Russian broadcast recordings uh, to create this podcast series. And if you're not familiar with the OSA website, I'll just show you very quickly. I'll do a little bit of an ad. Um, so this is the collection itself. Um, as you can see, there's 26,000 items, uh, and these are free for anybody to listen to. You just have to go to the website and view collection items. Uh, and if you want to search, you can search by so many different terms. You can search in terms of if you're interested in a specific year, or <coughs> if you know a little bit more and you know about uh, specific presenters or people involved with programming, then you can search by those terms as well. There's really so much. I, what we did was really just the tip of the iceberg, basically. Um, okay. Right, so what were we trying to do with this project? Um, our aim was to create a six episode mini series covering the period from the foundation of Radio Liberty in 1953, when it was referred to as radio liberation at the time, uh, right through until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Um, we wanted to make Blinken OSA audio material more accessible to non-Russian speakers, that was a very important aim, um, and also to non-experts. So the tone of the podcast is that we want to uh, aspire to academic credibility, but not without uh, 
um, accessibility is very important to the general public as well. I really wanted this to be some kind of gateway so that people could come to the OSA website, they're not sure where to start, they can click on a podcast, it's very easy to listen to, it's very, you don't need to download it, you'll just be able to stream it straight from the, from the website, and you can get a sense of, of, of what's going on at the archives, the wider projects, and it's kind of like a, uh, a key to, to opening up this, this huge resource, which can be a little bit difficult to navigate if you don't know where you're starting. Um, my personal interest in Radio Liberty, I'm interested in, in looking at uh, transnational broadcasters more, more broadly as practitioners of Cold War public diplomacy, um, especially in the way that they adapt and evolve over time. Um, in, the, in uh, interpreting their mission statement, I guess, um, to suit the political and social and cultural conditions of the moment and the changing strategic aims of the United States. Um, tying in with what Professor Phillips was just talking about, I think now is such a great time to study transnational broadcasting because we do have these parallels, these questions about the relationship between uh, public diplomacy, propaganda, fake news, all of these questions are so kind of prevalent at the moment, and I think now is a great time to reflect on how these issues were dealt with uh, in previous generations. I don't think that fake news is something that was invented in the early 2000s. I think this is something that has a historical basis, and we should, we should try and approach it through a historical lens. Uh, okay, so what do we actually do to make this podcast series? Well, the first thing uh, we did was jump onto the OSA website and start searching for interesting stuff, basically. Um, there's a huge, huge array of different material, and it was quite a challenge to try and select the programs that were, one, going to be most interesting to the listeners, but two, were also going to uh, fulfill some of the aims that, that, that we talked about previously. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that we had a real spread. Uh, so we, uh, our first program is on the death of Stalin, which happens four days after Radio Liberty is established in 1953, which is quite convenient. Uh, and we finish with a program for December 28, 1991, which is two days after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So there's a real spread, and we try to cover all decades in, in that period. Um, so I would uh, scroll through the website, trying, trying to find interesting stuff, and using my very, very, very limited Russian to try and work out what's going on in these programs. I would then send them to my colleague, Mikhail, who uh, would, do, would listen to them and say, yes, this is interesting, or no, I don't think this is as interesting as you think. And if they were interesting, then he would go on and translate those into English for, for my behalf. Um, I would then write a script based around that, that material, choosing the most interesting sections, the things that I thought uh, people would be most interested to hear about. Um, and then we would try and find some interesting piece of music, because these programs, the, these podcasts, programs are about half an hour long, and it's a, it's a nice thing if you're working with audio to split things into more manageable chunks. So in every episode we have a musical interlude where we try and choose a piece of music that's suitable. For example, uh, in the Death of Stalin episode, which is our first episode, we have um, uh, Mozart's Concerto 23, played by Maria Udina, which is a piece of music that Stalin requested while on his deathbed. So we try and make some kind of... Uh, genuine connection between the music and the, and, and the documentary aspect. Uh, recording, we're very lucky to have a, a small recording studio here at CEU. Um, so um, once a week, for the last six weeks, I've been popping up to the studio and recording my audio sessions, so I'm presenting the podcast as well. Uh, and I also have voice actors who come in and they read the English uh, translations of the original audio. Um, then the big job is the editing, bringing everything together. So we have the script audio, then we have the archival audio coming from the OSA, um, the voiceovers which go over the archival audio, the music and the intro and outro, all of that needs to come together. Then we have a proof listening session at the end and that's how we get the final product. Um, so our final product is uh, these six uh, episodes. We have an episode on the death of Stalin, 1953. We have a very interesting episode on the space race based on a program talking about the death of Yuri Gagarin in, in 1968 and using that as a jumping off point to talk about um, the similarities and differences between the Soviet and American approaches to the space race. Um, we have a program from 1972 which is super interesting on the war in Vietnam where a Radio Liberty uh, correspondent, a Soviet emigre correspondent, has travelled in Vietnam and is coming back and being interviewed and is being asked, well, what's the situation really like in Saigon in 1972? And he says a lot of things about how everything's absolutely fine, and 
Uh, it's not as bad as you might have heard in the Voivremia. <laughs> And uh, it, so, you know, this is super valuable stuff to, to deconstruct as public diplomacy. You're thinking, who is the audience? And what, what are the editorial decisions that are being made in these programs? Uh, my personal area of, uh, of most interest is episode four, the Helsinki Accords. My thesis is all about uh, the Helsinki process and transnational broadcasting in relation to that. Um, and that's very interesting to see the differences between um, the uh, earlier programs on the Helsinki process from 73, 74, 75, and then afterwards, once we have a, a Jimmy Carter and Big Brzezinski deciding that, the, that this Helsinki process is really going to be something they're going to push from 76, 77 onwards, the tone really noticeably changes in Radio Liberty's programming, so that's something worth noting. Um, 86 and the Chernobyl incident, super interesting because uh, the Soviet Union is undergoing this process of glasnost and claiming that they are opening up media. Then the Chernobyl incident happens and um, we have uh, big, big question marks about how much the Soviet people are actually told uh, about what happened and when, and the, and the time delays, and whether the Soviet Union's uh, official press only covered this because they knew that um, alarm bells had already been rung in the West. Um, and there are some big claims made in memoirs by Radio Liberty, former Radio Liberty employees, um, for example, Eugene Sosin, who claims that uh, it's because of the coverage that Radio Liberty um, gave to the Chernobyl incident, uh, which, which really put a huge amount of pressure on the Gorbachev regime to, to adapt and reform um, after, after Chernobyl, and this really gave a push to the Glasnost uh, movement. Now, it's very difficult to make those claims in a in a concrete way and say, yes, because Radio Liberty broadcast this uh, information about Chernobyl, this forced the Soviets to do this and this led to the end of communism. That's, you know, these very broad claims are very difficult to do, but what's clear is that um, this, uh, this, these broadcasts happened, they were out there and they had to be responded to. Uh, and I think the last program on the fall of the Soviet Union we take two programs, one from August 91, where Boris Yeltsin is interviewed very shortly after the, uh, the failure of the coup in 1991, and then in December 28th, uh, after the uh, official fall of the Soviet Union, two days earlier, we have a very, uh, a very kind of sermon-like uh, program where the presenter is talking about the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union in very grand terms, in the kind of terms that you would never have heard Radio Liberty use in the 70s or the 80s, but there's a real sense of the end of something. And the, the chaos, the instability, and the uncertainty that followed the fall of the Soviet Union is actually reflected in the output of Radio Liberty at the time. Um, OK. I don't think I'll have time to, to play the clip, but um, this whole series is, is currently, everything is still being edited. It's not quite up yet. But at the end of June, everything will be finished. And by September, certainly, it'll be in the podcast library, and I'll share it with all of you. Um, but the last thing I wanted to talk about was why should researchers interested in transnational broadcasting, which I guess most of us in this room are, think about podcasting as a format through which you can conduct research and kind of analyze the process by which you're coming to your conclusions. Because I find it to be a hugely valuable uh, thing, not just in terms of the output, but also in terms of my, my thinking um, and my processes as a researcher. Um, so. I think it will lead on to lots of other projects that if I had time I would love to do at the OSA and I would encourage other people who do have the time to do this. And you don't have to be here in Budapest to do this, this is the wonderful thing. Because this is all online, or so much of it is online, uh, and if you find a, a collection that's not online, please drop the OSA a line because there may be, you know, there may, there may be things that they can do that they are fantastically flexible and um, approachable organization in that sense. Um, but we really wanted to make this project something that would help make the archive more accessible to non-academics and non-experts, um, and that's why I think more and more of us are, are uh, accessing history online and, and listening uh, to podcasts more generally and audio documentaries. So this is something that you can put in your pocket, listen to on the train, um, and it's done in 25 minutes, and so it's, it's pretty easy to digest. Um, there are so many other outstanding audiovisual collections uh, at the Blinken OSA. Um, also, another Radio Liberty collection, which is absolutely fascinating, is their uh, published Samistat sound recordings. 
Um, so you have a lot of phone calls coming in from dissidents in the 70s and 80s into Radio Liberty that are recorded. Uh, people, you know, very, very famous dissidents, Sakharov, Orlov, lo loads of very, very fascinating people. And a lot of this material has not been touched and uh, is an absolutely invaluable historical resource if you're interested in uh, underground publishing or uh, dissident movement in the Soviet Union. Um, they have the Soviet Russian TV monitoring, um, RFE's Hungarian language broadcasts during the 1956 revolution. That's all available uh, through the special collection. Um, very, very interesting is this audio recordings of the Imre Nagy trial in 1958. Um, so, uh, you know, lots of people have talked about 56 in one way or another um, over the course of this conference, and that collection is absolutely invaluable. Um, the reason why I found this podcast project to be so fulfilling is that um, it's allowed me to learn how to do something new. I, I'm not a technological whiz. I, uh, trust me, if I can make a podcast, then anybody in this room can make a podcast. I mean it, because I, it, it's not something that I've done before, but it was something I was interested in. I, 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 I like listening to podcasts as a hobby, and really uh, the process of putting together the script, getting the audio, learning, learning how to use the Audacity software, which is free and you're available to download, has been a, a really interesting thing. And it gets you, in the, in, it gets you thinking like, like an editor. It gets you thinking like a producer. You start thinking in terms of what sounds good and what doesn't, and that helps you come to conclusions about why certain editorial decisions are made when you are uh, assessing these radio programs. Um, I also think that for a new generation of scholars, it's a really good idea to to, uh, to develop your skills as a, in a technological sense and, and start getting used to delivering content in, in new ways, basically. Um, I also th uh, think that the benefits to different archival institutions are huge. So I, I don't think this is something that just the OSA should do. I think that every archive should have a podcast series. And I know lots do. Uh, but I think every, everywhere should. And I think that it's such a great way to get young researchers uh, invested in the archive and in the, the content that they have, uh, and also to widen public engagement uh, and interest in the archive recordings. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Federal University, uh, and her paper will be on the image of the indigenous people of the USA in the cinematography of the socialist bloc. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, okay, during the 20th century, international relations have encountered an interesting, um, with an interesting phenomenon, a mutual confrontation between uh, two ideological blocs, capitalist and socialist countries, uh, and the parties realized that the traditional methods of introducing the war, the old war, would lead to a complete world destruction. The zero-sum game confirmed the necessity of our methods. At this point, hard power was replaced with soft power. The purpose of study is to investigate um, the influence of um, the relationship between two ideological blocks on the image of the American Indians in the cinematography of the socialist countries at a different stage of the Cold War. The subject of my analysis is the films uh, of um, the socialist countries came uh, about the Indians of the United Star the States. Uh, the, uh, the socialist countries, using the mechanism of soft power, sought to create the image of the United States as exploiters in relation to the Indians, who needed to be conveyed to people as a form of a mass culture. Cinematography should serve as a means of rapid dissemination of information for a large number of people, uh, cinema painlessly imposes a behavioral model and value system. Value system. The popularity of American and West European Westerns puzzled first and foremost the German Democratic Republic because of the success of its political adversary, um, the Federal Republic of Germany. On this topic, in 1965, it was decided at a meeting 
in the Central Committee of Socialist United Unity Party of Germany to create films that could eradicate the American values, the American influence on the mind of a socialist man, due to the fact the Hollywood Western that the Hollywood Western had um, had um, high popularity. The choice was made in favor of producing a special type of westerns. The countries of the social bloc concluded that showing the suffer of the disadvantaged indigenous people would be the most effective uh, way of eliminating American values, not only in their countries, but also in the whole world. In addition, the Indians were called a socialist people and the U.S. Uh, resi uh, residents uh, exterminated red people, closing spirit to the socialist man in the eyes of a viewer. The effect of the idea was impressive. Uh, this project was called Red Western. In 1966, in the film um, Du Soem de Grossen Bering, uh, an Indian tribe um, of Lakata Sioux was suffering because it owned what the conquerors need most, land and gold. Gold seekers are shown cruel, soulless, uh, mean and devoid of any honor and morality. Takei Ito, an Indian of this tribe, played by the very talented actor Goika Mitich, was uh, a prototype of an anti-capitalist warrior warrior uh, who was ready to sacrifice for his people became a standard for the audience who wanted to imitate him. The Indian was a socialist man's hero. Nobody desired to be white skin. Having achieved its task, Defa Studio decided to continue shooting. In 1967, in Chingachpuk, the struggle of the Indians for their lands and rights was considered as a class struggle. The thesis was consolidated. Capitalism was immoral for socialist people. In 1971, uh, in Osceola, which is about the Indian struggle for their territory, emphasizes the non-acceptance of a division uh, of soci society into classes. The Indians accept slaves who fled from, from the cruelty and injustice of their masters and fight equal rights for runaway slaves. As follows from the analy analysis, uh, analysis um, the theme of the Native American struggle for their territory runs like a golden thread uh, through these works. In 1972, in uh, Tikumzem, and in 1974, in Apache, Indians are shown to be hardworking. In 1975, in Uldzana, the tribe Apaches tried to survive in spite of the fraud of civil servants. Diametrically opposite image depict white skins as corrupt officials and murderers. In 1987, Mr. Michael Gorbachev proclaimed a new thinking which recognized the departure from the division um, of the world into two poles which had an impact on the plot of the film and selection of actors. Despite this, the old values were pre preserved, equality of classes, races and ethnic groups. Thus, a man from the bulwark of the Capuchins in 1987 directed by uh, Surikova, underlines not only the image of cowboys Indian relations, but also the absence of any rational and ethnic uh, discrimination. The USSR often resorted to the use of a surrogate product of American films, justifying it with ideological necessity. To crown it all, the image of um, indigenous peoples was used both to strengthen the foundation of socialist ideology, ideology and to anchor pro-American values. The method was, choos was chosen one of the most effective and in all respects advantages. For example, FBI agents uh, in their report of the pricing of the Lakota Sioux Indian tribe 
in Wounded Knee in 1973, called the viewing of the film Du Sonnet de Groschen Berlin, Berlin, among the reasons for the incident, which was the declared red propaganda, and the German Democratic Republic was accused of a well planned provocation. Thank you for your attention. presenter is Tomasz Potofi, who is an MA student at the Yamaha University, and he will be speaking about the Czechoslovak-Syrian relations and their media image during the first half of the Cold War. Okay, thank you for everyone. Uh, at first, I. I would like to tell you that uh, this is uh, a presentation in based on my uh, master thesis. Uh, besides the research from the media, I was trying to investigate after the events, uh, which I considered uh, to be the most important influencing uh, the relationship between the two countries. As uh, I was uh, working with the uh, sources from the press, I wanted to explore what they want uh, for the people to see. Uh, primarily, I was uh, working with the articles uh, found in uh, UISO, a Hungarian daily newspaper in Slovakia, uh, Czechoslovakia at that time, and uh, the Rude Pravo, which is a uh, Czech language newspaper. I, I had to change uh, to examine and deep my thesis with the video files as well and other primary sources notes from diplomatic conferences, uh, what uh, I found at uh, Woodrow Wilson Center uh, uh, Digital Archive. Uh, in the case of uh, Syria, I wanted to get a picture of people were uh, thinking from that time, what were these uh, things influenced them. Uh, connected uh, to this, I think the most basic element uh, was the Arab nationalists, the Nazareth and uh, Basis. Uh, I uh, had to leave out many things uh, which I think were relevant uh, factors, uh, but uh, these facts uh, uh, can be found in my master thesis, for example, the Eisenhower and some uh, other doctrines, the Arab-Israeli wars, the Baghdad Pact, or the uh, building of the Soviet harbor in Tartus in the 70s. Uh, because of uh, lack of time, I will uh, just shortly mention these factors. Um, I try, uh, I try to translate the essence of the selected articles from the press correctly, but uh, I uh, brought some original Hungarian and Czech copies for those who are interested for this after our section. Yes. Now, uh, at first, uh, some things about Czeslo Czechoslovakia. Uh, after the uh, Second World War, and especially after uh, 1948, uh, the uh, communist takeover, uh, the state uh, get to the Soviet sphere or, of influence. Uh, Czechoslovakia became another sat uh, Soviet satellite, and a uh, mark of disloyalty uh, was bitterly surprised in political trials on the supervision of uh, Soviet adv advisors. Uh, Czechoslovakia was also a constituent member of many Soviet-led international organizations, most notably the economic organization Comecon and the military organization Warsaw Pact. Uh, some fun facts. Uh, the Alvia, uh, this airplane, uh, was a propeller driving fighter aircraft built uh, after Second World War. Notably, the first fighter obtained by the Israel Air Force and used it during the first uh, Arab-Israeli war, and it uh, was exported by the Czechoslovakia. No, uh, in the early years of the Cold War, the international relations of the communist countries were uh, pretty much limited, and uh, uh, the relation with one other, their the previous and uh, traditional international contacts were either redirected or were uh, simply cut off, or their contacts were strictly frozen on a low diplomatic level. 
uh, we can here uh, also see that uh, Czechoslovakia haven't got any diplomatic sticks uh, with Western European countries, but have a lot of uh, uh, diplomatic sticks or economic sticks with African, uh, Asian uh, countries uh, from the Third World. Mm. In, in fact, uh, Czechoslovakia most valuable Western links began to be established uh, only around the late 60s, and that's especially after the Helsinki process. Role in the decolonization, which is very important in this theme. Um, Uh, the Czechoslovak uh, Communist Party handled the issue of decolonization in a very hypocritical way. way. One uh, hand uh, is constituted spread wide-ranging uh, jovial media propaganda in favor of the decolonized countries, while uh, on the other hand it made huge uh, weapon businesses with them, of course totally in secret. The pragmatic goal was to selling the weapons, it was underneath a massive media propaganda, which was uh, not too difficult to do uh, since all uh, press and media was strictly uh, centralized uh, under the censorship of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. For the domestic public, Czechoslovakia seemed a PC-loving country, which was determined to support the decolonization and deliberation movement uh, beyond the possibilities in the name of world peace. At the same time, Czechoslovakia, uh, with the Slovakian weapon industry too, was keen to exploit any need for guns and military equipment whenever and wherever there was need for it, throughout the war period of the Cold War. Uh, thus, the communist Czechoslovakia was an example, example of a hypocritical country as far as the decolonization was uh, concerned any newspaper reader or any uh, TV watcher could easily understand that it was nothing else but Marxism or socialism that means the only way out from the colonial dependency. Uh, like news, uh, newspaper slogans were uh, like socialism have colonized, uh, uh, colonized nations to get rid of the op imperialist forces, or it was the socialist revolution that has opened the door for the decolonization. Uh, oh, we can say that uh, this uh, overstressing the idyllic and humanistic side of the relationship with the decolonized countries without a single reference to the real economic nature of the relations. <coughs> Uh, just one more thing. Having been the closest political ally of the Soviet Union, the diplomatic sticks with Syria as all for their uh, one, their uh, two were preliminary uh, prelimin consulted and approved by the Soviet representatives. In fact, Czechoslovakia was selected by Moscow to be a spreadhead in the relation with the Third World. Later on, Czechoslovakia uh, wideness is a fruitful relation with these countries, like with Syria, who was the third biggest export country in the late 60s for Czechoslovakia in the region. <coughs> Among others, it supplied Czech military personnel and technical advisors, and also personnel who <coughs> helped to establish military education in Arabic countries, like Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and Libya. Now uh, we, we can see that in uh, the uh, 1920s, uh, Czechoslovakia have uh, opened a consulate in Syria, with, uh, what was a French mandate, uh, also like Lebanon, uh, and to the Second World War it was the biggest export uh, country for Czechoslovakia in the Middle Earth. Uh, relation was, uh, were stopped during the Second World War. The consulate was closed and was reopened only in 1955. Uh, the emigrated Czechoslovakian government recognized Syria in uh, 1942, uh, which became independent uh, four years later. Uh, in uh, 1948, there was an economic deal between the two countries of uh, uh, 
for uh, 40 million Czechoslovakian uh, crown. <laughs> Military uh, cups and patches uh, was a uh, uh, really lot of these in uh, Syria, was uh, not was a stable country and uh, was very in interesting how the uh, media reacted for this. Uh, I also, this was a uh, military uh, push uh, cup with uh, Shishakli, uh, Adip Shishakli, uh, and uh, also Husni uh, Zaim and uh, Sami El Hinavi. It uh, like uh, Zaim is influenced by the dollar, dollars, the imperials and their partners in Saudi Arabia. Moreover, in his army there are a lot of Hitler's agents. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shishakli's uh, coup served the imperialists. He wants to aggressively join the Baghdad Pact. The majority of the Syrian government is against the imperialists and super the Egyptian war of independence. Uh, the imperial, imperial agents were stopped by the independence fight in Egypt and Iran. The events motivated the Syrian people to stop being a provider to the West. In Rude Pravo, Shishakli's defeat was celebrated by the Syrians and the Western dream above the Baghdad part was over. And uh, this was, there was a, a really interesting fact. Uh, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser and the Nasserin was a really relevant uh, fact in uh, two, con two countries. Uh, sticks, diplomats and sticks uh, in uh, we can hear that Nasser became the bridge on which Arab leaders moved toward us. Uh, this was mentioned by the uh, Soviet uh, high politics. Uh, here is a, a primary source of uh, Hassan Tuhami, head of the intelligence branch uh, at the president's office to Gamal Abdel Nasser. Uh, uh, during the Bandung conference, the president met with uh, Zhu Enlai, who was willing to assist Egypt in its struggle against Israel. Zhu Enlai was willing to supply the Egyptian army with weapons from China, Moscow, or Czechoslovakia. We believe that Zhu Enlai contracted Moscow and uh, reached an agreement on this with officials there. During an interview with the Russian ambassador agreed on behalf of his uh, government to supply the Egyptian army with weapons including planes and tanks. This is change, change in the traditional Russian police, policy uh, which uh, means that the ambassador had instructions from Moscow to answer uh, the way he did and that is the government has already made its decision. Also one primary source a positive reply was given to the Egyptian and current negotiation over the selling of Czechoslovak weapons manufactured by over, over license is going on. The perception of Arab countries in these aggressive blocks, which are being created in the near and middle east, is a very important issue for the Soviet Union. Uh, hence, uh, our policies in these countries, and especially in Egypt, should be aimed at impeding to Anglo-American attempts to make other countries join those blocks. Therefore, it would be useful to find out whether the Egyptian government is going to continue with its policy of non partition in the Anglo-American military parts and how it will conduct in relation uh, with the Soviet Union in the future. Uh, it was re really in interesting. This, uh, Nasser is a went to uh, uh, buy uh, some weapons arms uh, to Syria and uh, the Syria delegate uh, visited the castle in Prague. Uh, this is from uh, Uso, also uh, from uh, Rude Pravo. Um, this was so typical. When, uh, uh, it was written that Syria delegate visited the castle in the Prague, had lunch with Stanek Fillinger and other uh, high uh, political uh, persons made a visit at the Clement Gottwald Mausoleum and took a look at the water power plant in Slepi, just like normal uh, diplomacy sticks between two friendly socialist states, and nothing was uh, right, right <laughs> above the arms. However, uh, just from other, another primary source, uh, 
when the Syrian Minister of Defense Khalid Al Azman came to Czechoslovakia in December of 1957, he wanted to Nazi trophies arms that was agreed by the Czechoslovakian government in 1955. And this is a picture from Rude Pravo. Syria has requested the weapon causing pain based on the Egyptian model that is that to say beside the weapons they had also uh, requested appro appropriated trainings to use them. Czechoslovakia and Syria concluded a total of six agreements for the sale of various specialty materials worth a total of uh, four, uh, 410 million Czechoslovakian uh, crowns. The Soviet Union also took part in the shipments for the uh, first few years, like this uh, tank. Uh, the arms business has also proved the way for the recovery of various trade links from the civil sphere bet between uh, 1955 and uh, 1960. Czechoslovak built an oil refinery, a sugar and a shoe factory in Homs and Syria. These achievements were often published in the media. Uh, I also used a uh, BBC video, Syria in the 50s. It was uh, really interesting that uh, uh, everyone just asked that uh, you are communist, you are communist. They uh, get, uh, gone to the minister and ask, are you communist? Uh, you were at Moscow uh, two uh, weeks before and you should be communist. Uh, I feel like in the West, in this time, everyone just got paranoid that in these uh, countries, everyone is going to be communist. Like, uh, <coughs> there was one, only one member from Communist Party, Colin Barnes, in the Syrian parliament. Uh, in May, in uh, 1957, in the Journal of Uso, there was a report made with Baghdad, and he described the Syrian population as a socialist, communist nation that only wants to defend against the Western aggression. In this article, focus on the strength of the Czechoslovak industry. It was written as if it was chosen over the imperialist companies because it was better. They also wrote about the uh, fights for independence against the imperialists and about the development of the sugar factory, shoe factory and all refinery parts. They also sold chairs, de desks and similar stuff for these factories. The Czechoslovakian also promised that they will train experts for these factories. And uh, there was a United Arab Republic. The most important things, I have a few minutes gone. Uh, that uh, from the West, afraid that uh, in these countries the communists will get to power. From the East, high hopes that uh, with rebel diplomacy and with help with development and air arming, they will be partners against the West. And <coughs> El Kuwaiti and Nasser, uh, there was written the uh, United Arab Republic's uh, paper. There was a video which, uh, uh, where uh, Nasser speak to the people. <laughs> I just want to show you how uh, Nasser uh, and their speeches uh, influenced the, and mobilized the Arab people. Uh, in 1958, Nasser instructed the parties to break down the Communist Party and Muslim Brotherhood went to illegality. The relation between the two countries froze. In uh, Czechoslovakia, the embassy was closed. And uh, after the United Arab Republic, only just in 1964, was a constitutional referendum approved a provision Carta, which was immediately suspended when a new group of military leaders from the Basel of Socialist Exchanges, another coup, uh, it was that uh, becoming Basque Party to the power. Uh, at the end of uh, 1966, Yusuf Zouai, the prime, uh, Syrian Prime Minister, visited Czechoslovakia to buy arms, cars and other tools for the next war. 
Of course, the media only showed just a little part of the visit. The friendly Syrian Prime Minister came to our country to visit our best industry, to make visits in the historical places. It was interesting that the Syrian students who study in Czechoslovakia were mentioned in, in this article. Uh, uh, after after uh, the Sixth Day War, uh, Syria uh, became the third largest economic partner to Czechoslovakia in the region. Syria also exported to Czechoslovakia also the values sold were for below the portions of goods, arms, weapons and other technical stuff. Syria's main export products were cotton, wool, barley, leather, <coughs> leather oil and uh, various exotic trees. Um, also that uh, uh, General Hafiz al-Assad uh, get to power in the 70s, which was uh, to the two countries uh, sticks uh, very positive and uh, get in a higher level. Uh, some fun facts about the media. The media didn't report the, about the arms deal, at exception Prime Minister William Shuroki uh, explanation of international processes. He doesn't talk about arms deals explicitly, however, he explained the relations of countries like India, Egypt, Indonesia, Syria, Burma, Afghanistan, and others that fight for the independence and the Czechoslovakia should, uh, should work together with these states. Uh, in this, uh, the Syrian Minister of Defense hints about arms deal. Uh, the arms, we have been asking for arms from the Western powers for years, but we did not get it. Finally, we embarked from to, uh, those who were ready to ship. We don't want to use these weapons against anyone, just to defend our borders and country. <coughs> we didn't mention that uh, Czechoslovakia and Soviet Union on their get from anyone. Czechoslovakia invested with a uh, credit in Syria to build a sugar factory and factory for hygienic products in Homs and Damascus. They also ship back products used for oil refinery, radio technology, and rubber industry. These investments were positively highlighted in the media. Good example for this is this article uh, from Uso about, about the thermostat company which used it to build factories at the Soviet Union, Syria, Poland, Hungary, Cuba, Egypt. Besides the thermostat uh, chipness, they built thermal power plants, sugar factories, tobacco dryers, and oil refineries. And I also remember that the workers got some medal of workers for the Czechoslovakia. Mm. And this is an industry of the Skoda at Pilsen. About the Syrian events, the Czechoslovakia media reports quickly and often. However, the events were described through the pr prism of the communist propaganda. They didn't report about the persecution of the Syrian Communist Party. An exception was an article from 1959, August, that said the Communist parties from Algiers, Morocco and Tunis reported that persecution of communists and other democrats in Syria and Egypt is unfortunately supporting the imperialists. And at the end, I want to show uh, a, a dynamic uh, period of uh, two countries uh, Diplomatic and other sticks. Uh, there was a pre Cold War uh, from uh, 1920s to Second World War and establishing a uh, contact uh, in the uh, time where the push was often hot contact uh, between uh, uh, 1955 and 1958, and that, uh, where uh, Nasser became uh, the uh, head of the United Arab uh, State that uh, they was frozen and uh, was uh, reopened or just began establishing uh, the contacts uh, here and uh, get to uh, intensifying uh, to the uh, sixth day and after after the sixth day uh, six days war and uh, the late uh, 90s uh, 60s. Uh, these contacts were more and more uh, uh, higher, and there was also the Czechoslovakian build an ac build an academic uh, school at uh, Damascus and seventies. Uh, uh, thank you.
until now, we can open the floor for discussion. So if there are any questions or comments for our panelists, please. <coughs> um, this is a, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Is it Denise? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, I was really interested by your paper um, and um, was uh, interested in whether you were expanding or contracting into, in, uh, in a different way. So um, are you talking about all Soviet bloc countries um, or just the GDR? And I think that question is really important because of the German relationship to American cowboys an American cowboy narrative, which dates to Karl May and the novels um, and something that had nothing to do with the Cold War, so that in Germany there would be a particular richness of that tapping of cultural memory, um, because the Germans were, um, many Germans were so well versed, be it through, there's a woman at Columbia who's doing work mm -hmm. on German cowboy cartoons, um, their novels, um, so there was a real deep fascination Germans traveling to the United States to see Native ritual dances in the interwar. So that there's, a, there's a, a long tradition there which would have made it particularly effective in Germany versus perhaps Czechoslovakia. I don't know uh, that history. Um, but um, the other um, interesting dynamic um, that you might want to look at is how the United States used the indigenous Native American um, in its cultural exports. Um, so the United States exported um, Native American dancers who would dance on stage um, as a part of their um, cultural presentations programs. Um, so there might be some interesting dialogue there as well. Um, but anyway, so I, so I, I, I was wondering about both narrowing and expanding. Okay. Well, when it comes to films that I research, yes, um, part of them. Uh, is uh, there is there are productions of DEFA, uh, the cinema studio of uh, Germany um, uh, Democratic Republic, um, but uh, I need to say that this red propaganda, this project was directed uh, from uh, by um, USSR by the USSR, uh, and the scene of these uh, films uh, were in many countries of socialist blocs. So this is very important. This is not only the project of DAFA. Okay. But thank you very much for this, um, uh, I think this information about novels and cinema, uh, I mean cartoons, because I want to uh, use, use it and I want to research this, um, uh, this part of, um, Propaganda. I can say that in order to find some another um, part of uh, this project. Yeah, I'd be happy to share my contact information because there's a whole <coughs> histor historiography of how the image of the cowboy and thus looking at the Native American as well um, is used in, in propaganda. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, I actually just wanted to follow up on Pro Professor Phillips's note. Um, Sergey Jou, Professor Jou has done some research on uh, cowboys and how they were depicted in the Soviet Union, particularly using the medium of film, mm -hmm. that you may want to look into. It's very interesting. And also, I had a question for uh, Stephen. Yeah. Um, I found your research, your project in general, which is absolutely fascinating. And I was wondering if you've uh, looked into post-collapse uh, broadcasts um, of Radio Liberty and whether or not uh, you have noticed any changes in rhetoric, format, because it was such an overnight mm -hmm. sensation. I was wondering if their format changed as well. Um, the closest I've got mm -hmm. is my cutoff point was 91, and the, the only thing I've got post collapse is that program I was talking about, which is literally two days after the 28th of December 1991. But already you can tell there's a complete change, mm -hmm. um, a real. It's almost as if everybody's gone, okay, the Cold War's over, anything goes. Um, because people are saying things on Radio Liberty that they would never have said three days before, <laughs> I feel. Um, there's a huge amount of material from the post-1991 uh, periods on the OSA website, available free to listen to. I would absolutely, I think it would be a really great project for somebody to do. Um, so if I don't get there first, go ahead and do it. <laughs> I had a maybe 
So on the related question for Stephen, yeah. I thought it's fascinating. I'm a huge fan of podcasts, so I look forward to this. And what I was reminded of is that I know there are historians uh, in my department who work on early modern Europe and who sort of reenact um, craft making from that period in order to better understand or to, in order to better work. So I was wondering how for you the process of making radio yourself, how it may change how you would use radio as a source in your academic research. It definitely, I think, gives you a new perspective when, when you are thinking about editorial decisions and what actually makes good radio. I mean, we all consume radio, obviously, on, yeah. a, on a daily basis, but when you actually think about the, the mechanics of how do you get the, the right people in the room, how do you make sure that you know, these things actually sound good, and how do you make the, um, the transitions uh, between you know, embedded audio and presenting and all these kind of things. Um, Absolutely, you go through that process when you, I've gone through that process when I'm making this podcast and it has forced me to reflect on the choices that, that uh, you know, policymakers and editorial staff and presenters made when, when producing this program. Um, so that's, yeah, that's why I think particularly in, in, in regards to people who are interested in the history of broadcasting, yeah. I think doing this process, making videos, making audio yourself is so, so valuable. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Tamás for his bravery <laughs> that he made it here. Thank you, Tamás. And um, uh, believe me that his, uh, his work in, in his native language uh, might be a little bit more coherent than it, it was or it may have appeared uh, here today. But yet, it was clear that uh, here was a fine example of the double face of Czechoslovak uh, contemporary press showing in the one way something and the other doing something. Else. Of course, the, the, the weapon shipments to Syria have been long known. It, it's nothing new. However, concrete and specific examples bring, he brought up from the, from the printed press, this is what made his work. Uh, and, 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 and also that it's quite actual in, in Slovakian context. Nowadays, as the tragic event in Syria have been in one place. One, one more thing, right? Yes, yes, I, I know that much. And it's a huge debate whether it was fine, it was good or not. And and what was it that we delivered huge amount of heavy artillery and, and stuff like that? Are we responsible? And this is a fine example in the in the in the Slovakian contemporary Slovakian press, how debate over current and past events can so thank you very much. It was very nice to, to listen to you, uh, Denise. And just one thing that there, I, I have, I, I know quite a lot of Slovak and Polish historians dealing with same topics, heroes and anti-heroes. It's, it's a lovely topic. Thank you very much for your presentation. And a wonderful congratulations for your wonderful work. And I'm looking forward to the outcomes. And I would like to pick up and ask one particularity, and which is the, um, uh, you raised the question whether and if, and if yes, then how Radio Liberty influenced the behavior of the Russian, of the, of the, of the Russian government, or the Soviet government, uh, during the Chernobyl crisis. Well, it perfectly fits into the, into the pattern. Western stations and media, truth or not, did make an impact. One of them was the pressure they put on the government. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm, I'm really keen to asking you to elaborate on this. So how, how do you see the pressure side of the Western media on the, on the Eastern media in this particular case of the Soviet Union? Certainly. I think this is um, the, kind of like the golden goose for people who are interested in transnational broadcasting, is how do we explain right. the impact of this broadcasting when it's so difficult to, to quantify? Um, because you couldn't do, you know, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty did audience research to an extent, but th the way that that research was done, you can't just waltz into the Soviet Union in, in the 1950s and ask people, well, are you listening to this? Are you listening to that? Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's valuable stuff, but, but it's limited. Um, one of the areas um, that I am most interested in, in terms of understanding um, the impact of these broadcasts, is not just looking at... Uh, the public as a kind of uh, amorphous mass, but looking at certain groups within 
uh, Soviet society who would have a vested interest in listening to this information. So for one example, for, for one, you've got the government itself, right? So in Hungary, uh, we know, uh, Istvan Rev has written about this in, in his brilliant article, Just Noise, the Hungarian government has listening stations set up. They want to be able to, they know that people in Hungary are listening to this. They want to, they want to listen to it so that they can refute it directly. Um, also, I think Communist Party members who are ambitious, who want to listen in to understand this, this is what Radio Liberty is saying, how can I spin this to my advantage within the Communist Party, how can I make proposals or reforms that in some way relate to this material that's being put out there by the radios. Uh, so, uh, and I think that that is reflected in the kind of programming that Radio Liberty puts together as well. Uh, they're thinking about who their audience is, um, and this is true with Radio Fear, but I think somebody talked about um, you know, rural uh, audiences, for example. So there's a lot of programming about agriculture and farming. There's a huge amount of it, actually. Um, if you look at Radio Free Europe's uh, program schedules from the 50s and 60s in particular. Um, and these act as hooks. You know, you get people listening for specific information, um, and then, you know, or uh, take the teenager part of programming in Hungary, right? Get the kids listening to, um, you know, uh, the music in the 60s and 70s, and who knows, they might leave it on and pick up some news and, you know, th th this stuff all has an impact. But you're right, the difficulty is measuring that impact. It's very tricky business and uh, it's something that I'm very interested in, um, but don't have any very firm answers about at the moment. Yeah, I just kind of a thought to follow up on that. I mean, I think it's pretty typical that Western governments keep potential disasters secret for some time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's difficult It's difficult to say how long they would have kept it secret without this thing. But maybe it's something like compare, that can be done by comparing countries with a f free press, relatively mm -hmm. free press, and countries without a free press. Maybe it's something that's interesting in this way, that there are comparable kind of situations. I don't know. I, it's an interesting thought. I agree. I think that, that you have to compare. I, I think it's it's very sensible to treat these uh, Cold War broadcasters not in isolation. Don't just treat them as Cold War broadcasters and say, oh, we just compare Radio Free Europe with Voice of America or, or whatever. Look at what uh, the, 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 the mainstream Western media is doing and look at the similarities and differences between their structures, their institutions. They, sh the, you know, they share journalists. Journalists move from the New York Times to Radio Free Europe or, you know, they don't exist in this in this hermetic bubble away from the rest of the media, so I completely agree. On the Chernobyl thing, um, what's very interesting is in one of the uh, programs that I, I've made excerpts from for this podcast, uh, Radio Liberty refers directly to nuclear accidents that have happened in the United States. They talk about the Three Mile Island incident in 79, and what they say is, because they know that that's been covered in the Soviet media, <laughs> Um, and so they say, oh, well, yes, of course, we've had nuclear accidents in the past as well, but we've learned the lessons from these, and we've invested in new technology, and we've put all these new safety features in. And the Soviets were offered all of this information by the Americans, but chose not to implement it because it was too expensive. And this explains this, you know, what, why this catastrophe happened in 86. Um, so you see this very sophisticated uh, interaction with other media sources happening at the same time. Radio Liberty knows what, you know, what other people are saying about this and they're trying to bring everything together so they have this very sophisticated effort of public diplomacy. I have a question, just kind of listening, I'm not, I don't have much of a background in media, and so over the past two days, kind of listening to this and thinking about current times, it's kind of um, a general question kind of that everybody has who has more experience than I do. Um, what I'm seeing is, if you'd asked me two days ago if uh, um, if I thought an open press uh, had more bias than like a government-controlled press, you know, I would have been like, oh, well, obviously a government-controlled press. But thinking about what, you, uh, what everyone's been saying about Radio Free Europe, and then thinking about the current days of, of like uh, um, of kind of the sensationalism and messaging that we see in, in press today, it seems that uh, that government propaganda maybe had j just as much, or maybe even less, or more. Influence than, than sensationalism and media consumerism also has uh, in the press today. And I was wondering, if, maybe if any of you have seen the, that kind of being borne out in your research, where yes, maybe maybe actually in fact that the Radio Free Europe was a little bit more honest because they were trying to, to, to base their facts off of truth 
and they thought that was more powerful or, or less so because they're trying to uh, create truth. I'll have a go. Um, <laughs> I think if you look at, um, so the OSA has uh, a lot of um, audience research reports from Radio for Europe from, from across the period that it was broadcasting in Eastern Europe. And, and if you look at those reports, you see uh, that um, media consumption is, uh, uh, people who are giving their opinions on, 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 on their media consumption are, they're sophisticated <coughs> media consumers in a sense, and that they have, uh, you know, people are fully aware of what Radio Free Europe is to some extent, and they don't, um, those who listen are critical listeners. Um, so I don't think that, and, and you know, there are alternative media sources, and people don't just listen to Radio Free Europe and, and, and turn away from all state media. You know, they, 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 they consume both at the same time, and um, so I think, um, yeah, I think I, the, the idea that um, sensationalism is, uh, is, is a historical phenomenon and it's something that um, we can definitely draw links between um, these kind of state broadcasters and their, and their Cold War missions and, um, and the private uh, media. Because, as I said, I think there's a lot of crossover in terms of personnel, in terms of people listening in and thinking, oh, that's very interesting, we should do that on our show. Um, of people stealing ideas and this kind of thing. So yeah, there's definitely a huge amount of crossover, and I don't think we should see it. I, mean, I think, you know, speaking of that, it's a, it's a really interesting implicit um, problem or um, uh, point in what you're asking. Um, and when I look at um, the broadcasts um, then versus now, what I think of is choice. So um, there were stations, they were jammed. How many choices did you have? Mm -hmm. um, even if you were in the US, there were, you know, there was CBS, NBC, ABC, and a couple of others. Um, and <clears throat> within those radio stations, I think Edward R. Murrow um, broadcasting um, from London, there was, there was, the idea was that you were going to present the truth, right? So that was, that was the aim, that was the point. Um, and what Walter Cronkite, um, you know, we had these media figures um, who were like Abe Lincoln, right? You know, they, they were going to come into our living rooms and tell us the truth. That was the point. And then you had to juice it up a little bit, jazz it up um, to, so that you would choose channel ABC versus CBS or whatever it was. Um, but, um, but there really was an etiquette of truth, shall we say. Um, and um, then somehow, um, you have this expansion um, of choices, and therefore the need to to get attention, right? Um, so then people divide up in terms of um, ideology. So we're going to frame it for our audience to grab the audience. Um, so there isn't so much. Um, I, I would say that there was a, a really distinct shift with the explosion of media, and it's I think kind of what we also see a lot with the more choices consumers have. Um, the more choices you have on Facebook, the more you narrow it to your friends because you're completely confused, right? So, um, so the, the, the more choices you have, um, the, the more you focus on um, reinforcing your own beliefs, um, which is a fascinating paradox, right? It really shouldn't be that way. It should be the other way around. Um, but it, but it, it's a fascinating question. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we have some time. Sure. Uh, so let me <coughs> uh, make a comment on um, on, um, on Dennis's um, presentation. It was very interesting, and uh, of course, as you mentioned, that, uh, that the main issue is here whether this came from the Soviet Union, uh, the whole idea of, of of making this kind of red vestments, or <coughs> or this was a kind of indigenous uh, German uh, uh, initiative. So, uh, first of all, I would like to ask you whether you have any any particular um, information, right, like source material or primary sources, uh, to prove uh, that this came uh, from the Soviet uh, party leadership or Soviet um, leadership or government um, as a, as an initiative in the, in the mid 1960s. Uh, so definitely, this would be something to, uh, to to try to explore. That is, in the archives in in Moscow, uh, these kind of so-called soft topics are, are more or less researchable even today. Uh, so that would be something which, uh, which would be very good for you to, to try to, to get more 
the more evidence of about that. But it, that's, that, that sounds very logical, but, but, but uh, it, it's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. We don't really uh, know it until we can actually prove it. And then the next question is, why the GDR? Why not Romania? Uh, why not Hungary? Why not Czechoslovakia? Uh, uh, why not Poland? Uh, and then we have to go back to what, what Vicky has already mentioned uh, briefly, uh, the kind of very uh, um, um, the delicate or very, very uh, kind of a peculiar um, heritage of Karl May, uh, the, the novel writer Karl May, who, are, <coughs> who had a very special treatment in the, in the GDR. Actually, uh, he, his novels were not published uh, uh, in the GDR, uh, and these, uh, these red movies, that uh, Westerns were also not based on Karl Marx's uh, <coughs> movies, but on Cooper's, mostly on Cooper's uh, um, so-called original um, like uh, narratives. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the, the specialty is that actually uh, Karl Marx was German, uh, while Cooper was American. Uh, so, and not only that, but actually uh, uh, th th there are many characters in, in Karl Marx, um, especially Vinetu. Vinetu is uh, something like, which I always tell my American friends, who is the uh, most famous uh, American person in Europe? You know, and, 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 and they say, well, Lincoln, well, no, yeah, it's Winnetou. You know, and they never heard about Winnetou. And then they well, who, what, what Winnetou? And in, uh, in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe, that's a common heritage. Vinetou, everybody uh, read Winnetou uh, as a child. Uh, even, even uh, already in the 1930s, you know, and then in the 40s, but then uh, even under communist rule in Hungary, Vinatu was published in a shortened version for the use. You know, it was uh, doctored uh, because there were several problems to be uh, omitted, but um, like like religion, for for instance, uh, <clears throat> and a kind of racism uh, also because in in Vinatu, uh, uh, all the white persons, the few white persons who were good guys, were German. All of them, or Shatterhand, uh, or Firehand, or Death, the big yeah. three, uh, 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 like heroes of the of the of the big novel, uh, were all German, and all all the other, you know, bad guys, who white bad guys, were basically Americans or English or, or coming from other nations, but all the good guys were all always German. Uh, but still, uh, with all that, you know, the the the, the, the novels were not published, but. Um, uh, but uh, there, there was a, a, a kind of Karl May Museum in, in Radebell, uh, which is a suburb of Dresden. Uh, and, and I was there as, a, as an exchange um, student in 1970, and we, we visited it. There was a very nice museum with all the, all the rifles and, and, and all the kind of things which you, you need for a museum like that. So it was uh, because he was born in that little uh, town. And uh, so there was a museum, but, uh, but, the, the, but the novels were, were not published. But then, a kind of heritage, heritage was also uh, channeled into, uh, into these uh, uh, Westerns, anyhow, uh, altogether. So uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure I cannot prove it, but that it's something like, uh, like to prove for, for, a, for a young researcher, or, or others as well, um, uh, to, 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 to try to prove that uh, this kind of special uh, German um, heritage uh, based on karma, you know, which was actually uh, concealed, no, nobody talked talk, talk about that, of course, but still was the key factor why, uh, why these red movies, actually red uh, westerns that were made in the GDR and not, <coughs> not in other, not in other uh, uh, countries. And of course, the, 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 the main issue which you mentioned with, uh, with Goiko Mitic, of course, that's, that's, that's a kind of specialty because uh, to produce a, uh, 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 kind of an Indian, American Indian looking uh, uh, like star, a uh, male star, would have been very difficult in the GDR perhaps. Uh, and uh, and Goiko Mitic was a, a right choice and uh, he was very popular of course in the whole region. Yeah, he's very uh, talented, he was. And he is actually, he lives now uh, but don't uh, make, don't make movie. Well, uh, when it comes to your first question about uh, um, the USSR participation uh, in this decision, uh, as I um, I can say you uh, the exact article that I uh, uh, that I read, but the main references that is you uh, you saw um, at the end of my presentation it was the main the 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 main references, uh, but. Uh, I read that the USSR advisors 
was in at this <coughs> meeting in 1965 uh, with uh, at this meeting of the um, um, studio, um, uh, cinema studio, and they were decided what we should do in order to eradicate these American and West European uh, values. Okay, thank you. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. I missed uh, what you guys are talking about, about the change in media from being, you know, kind of the fetishization of fact to the overwhelming nature of fact. Do you think that that's something that's been deliberately undertaken by governments as well? I mean, if you read things like uh, the Gulf War did not take place by Jim Boudra, I can't really say French names, and you look at some of the documentary uh, makers in the West now, they are kind of implying that maybe governments are deliberately overloading us. I mean, this first Gulf War was the, f the kind of first war that we had where media was 24 hours. You could just watch it all the time. We had the internet, we had 24 hour news, and yet we only saw that we weren't dying. We didn't see that the Iraqis were dying so much that we had to send people out on patrol to shoot the dogs eating them. You know, this is, it's like a loss of life which is huge. But when you're sitting at home in America or in Britain, you just know that your boys aren't dying. And for me, that's so much more powerful than saying something uh, about fact. Yeah, that's so much more powerful than putting up two numbers. It's incredible. You don't even know what you've done. I think there was a huge shift with the Vietnam War um, because um, you know, television was relatively new and certainly um, that kind of journalism was new um, and the press you know, had incredible access to these images of death, um, which interesting when you look at American truth um, and um, uh, I was thinking whether it, the, 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 the executive branch as a teller of lies goes back to the Vietnam era and how did Radio Free Europe report on Watergate, which is something that Elena's looked at. Um, so you have this moment where the press is uncovering government lies, right? Um, and um, yet now um, the question is um, with the Gulf War, you know, these are, it's 24 hours, but it's also very heavily controlled, right? We, uh, go ahead. Well, I don't know. Something that's always seemed strange to me and something that I think we've spoken about is that, like, the Cold War was successfully branded as a Cold War when you have, like, Vietnam and Korea and the Soviet-Afghan War and, you know, the Swiss crisis and, 19, and the 1956 Hungarian uprising and all of these sort of proxy wars. And, like, like to me, that's the craziest thing, that, like, you know, the PR battle that both the United States and the Soviet Union have both really successfully won is that, like, I feel like in both countries, especially in the United States, you still think of it as a bloodless war because the Soviet Union and the United States never directly went to war. But that, that to me, is, like, the most interesting obfuscation of truth that both countries were sort of complicit in and sort of tacitly agreed upon. Um, it's always been interesting to me. If I may, oh, okay. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think it's really interesting that you brought up the Vietnam War, because when the fir question was first raised about like, truth versus what's happening now, I was gonna raise up the movie from the 70s network, um, just as <laughs> a very, um, kind of contemporary look at this issue, but actually taking place during um, Watergate, during the Vietnam War. So I think it's interesting to see that these issues that we're dealing with now, you know, were being um, written about or filmed during the Cold War as well, and even that early. Okay, if I may also join in, I have a couple of comments, questions for our panelists, for Stephen. Uh, we already discussed about the impact of the broadcast, and I presume that there were internal evalu evaluations of radio programs. I think it would be really interesting to analyze them and see how they constructed truth to follow up on the keynote lecture, so how they made their truth more truthful. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and also about the uses of music. I know that Radio for Europe had a, a program in Romanian that dealt exclusively with rock music mm -hmm. in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and it had a huge political impact among the teenagers, not because of the actual program, but because of how the regime, the Romanian communist regime, reacted to it by forbidding it and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So this is for you, for Denise. Was it only ideology that was driving socialist states into making this threat westerns? I mean, were there also entertainment purposes? And I'm thinking, for instance, of a Czechoslovak movie, uh, Lemonade Joe, from 1964, mm -hmm. which is a parody yeah. of the Western. I'm also thinking of a trilogy of Red Westerns that was made in Romania in the late 1970s, and it dealt with uh, Transylvanians going into the Wild West. <laughs> so I even have the titles here. The Prophet, the Gold, and the Transylvanians. The Artist, the Dollars, and the Transylvanians. The oil, the baby, and the transylvania. <laughs> and they're still quite popular and quite famous to this day. And for Tomas, how important was Syria as a partner within Czechoslovakia's trade? Was it, well, not the most important, one of the more important? How did it evolve over time? And also, uh, starting from this question about the, the type of weapons that Czechoslovakia was exporting, I mean, of course, there were relics from the from World War II, but there were also, and I'm thinking of the Soviet Union uh, export case when they were exporting latest generation weapons, especially when they had all these uh, uh, hot conflicts. Um, yeah, so on the question of internal review of programming and effectiveness and this kind of thing, um, I think there is material at the OSA that, that, that addresses effectiveness of broadcasting definitely but not 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 so much on a program by program basis and i wonder whether a hoover institution in the in the rfd corporate records uh, would be a good place to, uh, or broadcast records would be a better place to look for that but certainly there was uh, an effort made by the research department to try and um, establish uh, causal links between their programming uh, the the extent of listenership and shifts in public in, in, in opinion. So, for example, in my research for my MA thesis on uh, the impact of transnational broadcasting on opinions regarding the Helsinki process in Hungary and Poland, um, there's a clear statement made by an RFE audience research report um, that looks at RFE's output concerning Helsinki in the period 73 to 78, and it boldly claims that we can see that because of RFE's coverage of the Helsinki process, people who are listening to RFE are more positive about the Helsinki process. So there is clearly this, this internal effort to say, we're putting out these kind of programs, we want to have this end product in terms of public opinion, and we are achieving that. That's the claim that's being made. But of course, that's an RFE internal document. Somebody who's writing that wants people to think that the that, that audience research department are having an impact otherwise they're going to lose their funding or whatever. So you, you do need to be critical, but yeah. it's clear that they're making that claim. I presume there should also be memoirs of people who work for radio. Yeah, and, and of course, in all of these memoirs, yeah. they're and saying that what they were yeah. doing was yeah. very yeah. important yeah. And, yeah. and valuable and mm -hmm. successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, on the question about um, the tasks, uh, the goals of these uh, productions, I can say that the most important thing is uh, to strengthen the socialist foundation, but yes, you're right, because uh, the entertaining part is also very, very important. Uh, but as we do know, uh, at, uh, at these times, it was very, very difficult to publish something, to produce something without permission of politician, of society, and etc. Uh, about Leon and Joe, um, my films, my research was about uh, the role, the part of Indians, because uh, I present to you just a part of my research, because I, um, the whole uh, research uh, is about uh, the evaluation of uh, uh, Lakota Sioux, is an Indian tribe. Uh, in, uh, at, um, during the 20th century and uh, from uh, 20th century 
to this day. Uh, that's why I choose just some of them, not Limonadjo, uh, because yes, we will uh, we see, we see some of uh, parts about Indians, but it's not a lot in order to say what wanted um, um, people say about Indians. Uh, okay, um, it was important partner from uh, Czechoslovakia. It was the third biggest partner, which I, I re remember mentioning. Uh, but uh, Czechoslovakia has a, a few more partners in the region, like Egypt, uh, Libya, and uh, so I I think it was a, a really relevant partner to export and the arms deal too, uh, but these arms deal uh, was uh, suggested and forced by Moscow. But, and uh, about the guns, mm, uh, what I remember from my days is I don't know uh, about the arms really, or arms, arms history, history of wars, uh, but uh, they, they, they was a, 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 a fight for tanks with a, a Skoda motors, uh, which is uh, was really a uh, fun fun or a uh, Delphin uh, R29 uh, uh, fighter planes uh, which was uh, really effective to training the uh, Arab uh, pilots on aircraft against the planes uh, uh, guns um, you can see it in my thesis. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And there were some landmines as well and uh, spare parts of tanks. Yeah. Basically, these were the most important. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for a wonderful panel. Thank you.